Woohoo! So what we're going to see today is our first method of integration. So now that we've learned about the fundamental theorem of calculus, we know that to evaluate integrals, what we need to do is find antiderivatives. But that's not so obvious. So finding the derivative of a function is always straightforward. You just apply differentiation rules. But finding the antiderivative of a function is not uh, easy in general. In fact, it's quite complicated. So what you need to do is undo differentiation rules. And this is not easy. So what we'll do now is study our first method, which is called substitution. And what it does is that it undoes the chain rule for differentiation. So let's start with an example. Suppose that you want to integrate the function x times cos of x squared. So in other words, you're looking for a new function which is such that its derivative will give you back x times cos of x squared. Well, that's not so obvious, but if you think about it for a little while, you'll probably come up with the answer, which in this case is 1 half sine of x squared plus the arbitrary constant of integration. So how do I know that this is the right answer? Well, if I take the expression that I wrote, take the derivative, and then I'll recover the integrand. So indeed, this is the general antiderivative. But it was not so obvious. And the reason that it was not so obvious is because if when I take the derivative of the expression here, I actually have to use the chain rule, right? Because I have a function of a function. So somehow, when I integrated, I had to undo the chain rule. Now, in this case, the application of the chain rule is pretty straightforward, so I could undo it in my head. But if you have complicated applications of chain rule, it is very difficult to undo the chain rule. Can we come up with a general method for undoing the chain rule? Well, this is precisely what substitution is. So let me show you how it works in this example first, and then we'll derive it in full generality. All right, so I start with the same integral, but now I want to evaluate it in a more formal way. So what I'll do is introduce a new variable, which I will call u, which I'll take to be equal to x squared. And we'll see in a second why this is a good choice here. OK, now I can certainly take the derivative du dx, and I get 2x. And the next step, I'll bring the dx on the right-hand side. Now, this is a little n wavy, right? It doesn't really make sense to do that, but we'll see in the next slide that this is perfectly rigorous. OK, so now, I, now that I have that, the idea is that I want to transform my integral, which was in terms of x, in terms of a new integral, in terms of the new variable u. Right, so first, let me just shuffle things around a little bit. So let me just rewrite the integral as follows. And then I want to transform this expression into an expression in terms of u. Well, first, I can certainly replace x squared by u, because this is how I defined u. But next, I also need to replace dx and the x here in terms of u. But I've just proved that du is equal to 2x dx, which also implies that du over 2 is equal to x dx. So I can replace x dx here by du over 2. But now I have a new integral in terms of u, which I can certainly evaluate. This is a pretty easy one. So I get 1 half the integral of cosine, which gives me just 1 half times the sine of u, plus the constant of integration. All right, but that's not the end of the story, because this is the result in terms of u. But I started with an equation in terms of x. So I want to substitute back in terms of x to get my final result, which will be 1 half sine of x squared plus constant of integration, which is indeed what we calculated above. So this is how substitution works in practice. So what you want to do is you start with an expression in terms of x. You want to transform the integral into a new integral in terms of u, which is easier to evaluate. And then you can evaluate it and go back to the original variable. All right, well, why did it work? Let me now prove in full generality that you can use the substitution method to undo the chain rule. So substitution will be useful if you can rewrite your integral as an integral of a function f of another function g of x, so that's a composite function, times g prime of x dx, for any f or g. If you can rewrite it in this way, then substitution might be useful. So let me show you how this works. So let me pick an antiderivative capital F of lil f. So in other words, the derivative of capital F gives me back lil f. Now I can certainly rewrite the integral as being the integral of capital F prime of g of x times g prime of x dx. And now I claim that this integral is nothing else than capital F of g of x plus an arbitrary constant of integration. Why is that true? Well, I'll show that this is just a chain rule. So it will be true if the derivative of that gives me back the integrand. But this is exactly what the chain rule gives me. So the derivative of capital F of g of x plus the constant well, the constant here disappears because its derivative is 0. And to calculate the derivative here, I need to use the chain rule. So I get first derivative of the outer function 
times the derivative of the inner function, which is indeed exactly what I had in the integral. All right, so why is that useful? Let me now introduce a new variable u, which I'll take to be g of x. So now I can certainly rewrite this expression as capital F of u plus a constant c, but I know what this is. This is the general antiderivative of capital, capital F prime of u du, right? Because if I take the derivative of capital F of u plus c, I just get capital F prime of u, which is nothing else than the integral of little f of u du because capital F is an antiderivative of little f. And I claim that this is exactly what substitution does. So indeed, this is the substitution method whereby I'm taking u equals to g of x and du is equal to g prime of x dx. So if I start with the original integral, substitute g of x for u and substitute g prime of x dx for du, I recover this integral, which I've just shown. I've just proved that the two are the same. And in the previous example, this is exactly what we did, where we took our substitution to be u equals to x squared, and then du was equal to 2x dx. So what we did was exactly an application of the substitution method. All right, so let me summarize by presenting the formal statement of the substitution rule. So if u equals to g of x is a differentiable function and f of x is continuous over the range of g of x, then the statement is that the integral of this complicated looking integrand, so f of g of x times g prime of x dx, will be equal to the integral of f of u du, where I'm setting u equals to g of x. So in other words, I'm allowed to do the substitution u equals to g of x, as long as I also transform g prime of x dx to du. And what it does is just undo the chain rule. This is exactly what the substitution rule is. But in practice, what this means is that if you're given an integral in x, you can do a substitution u equals to g of x and also transform du as g prime of x dx. You're always allowed to do that, but it will be useful if you can then rewrite the integrand as a function of u and that this new function is easier to integrate than the original integrand that was as a function of x. All right, so let's look at another example. Suppose that you want to calculate the integral of sine of x over the fourth power of cosine of x. How can you do that? So you want to do a substitution. So you want to define a new variable u as a function of x, such that once you rewrite the integrand as a function of u, it will be easier to integrate. So what substitution should you do? Well, there's no easy way of figuring it out. There's many substitutions you could do. Some of them might be useful, some of them might not. So the more problems you work on, the faster you will be at figuring out what substitution is the right one to do. Now in this case, the one that you want to do is u equals cos of x. And we'll see why this is the right substitution to do. All right, so I also need to transform the dx, so I'll take the derivative du dx, which gives me minus sine of x, and bring the dx on the right-hand side to get the transformation for the du in terms of dx, and I get minus sine of x dx. Okay, so now I see what happens. So in the, denom in the numerator here, I have sine of x dx, which is just minus du, so I can rewrite my numerator as minus du, and the denominator is cos of x to the fourth power, but u is cos of x, so I get u to the fourth power. Now you see why I chose that particular substitution, because now the integrand becomes much easier to integrate. Right? This is just minus the integral of u to the minus 4, which I can certainly integrate. I'll get minus u to the minus 3 over minus 3 plus a constant of integration. So in other words, 1 over 3 u cube plus my constant, and don't forget you need to rewrite everything in terms of x at the end because you started with x, so you want to finish with x. So I need to do the substitution back, and I'll get 1 over 3 cos cube of x plus the constant of integration, which is the final result, which would not have been obvious, by the way, just looking at this integral. So substitution uh, undoes the chain rule, but it's not always obvious how it does that. All right, but you can always check your answer. So you could start here, calculate the derivative. You see you, you do need indeed to use the chain rule because this is cos cube of x, so it's a composite function. But if you do that right, you'll get exactly sine of x over cos to the fourth power of x. So this is the right answer. So to end this video, I want to show you how you can use substitution for evaluating definite integrals as well. So let me look at the same function that I had before, so sine of x over cos of x to the fourth power, 
but now I want to integrate it from 0 to say pi over 4. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I know that one way I can do that is just to first find an antiderivative of the function and then evaluate between 0 and pi over 4. And I've just done that in the previous slide, so I found that the general antiderivative was 1 over 3 cos cube of x plus a constant. Here I can set the constant to 0, and then I just need to evaluate at the two limits of integration, so I get 1 over 3 cos cube of pi over 4 minus 1 over 3 cos cube of 0. Cos of pi over 4 is just 1 over square root of 2, so I get this here minus 1 over 3. can pull the 1 over 3 out, and I end up with 2 square root of 2 minus 1, which would be my final result. So this is one way I can do it. I first find an antiderivative, rewrite everything in terms of x, and then evaluate at the limits of integration. But in fact, you can do it in a nicer way, where you uh, not only substitute to, to use substitution to find the antiderivative, but you also substitute for the limits of integration. And this is generally a preferred way of solving uh, definite integrals using substitution. So let me show you how this works. So suppose that I haven't calculated the antiderivative yet. So I don't know that the antiderivative is 1 over 3 cos cube of x. So how can I do that? So what I want to do is just as I did before, so I want to use a substitution. So I'm going to define a new variable u as being cos of x, just like I did before. du dx is minus sine of x, and then du is minus sine of x dx. But what I also want to do here is substitute or transform the limits of integration, which are in x here, in terms of new limits of integration for u. Right? So what I can do is the following. So if x is equal to pi over 4, then by looking at the transformation here, I get that u is equal to cos of pi over 4, which is 1 over square root of 2. And similarly, if x is equal to 0, then u is equal to cos of 0, which is 1. So using this, I can transform the integral here and get a new integral where now my lower limit of integration is 1 and the upper limit of integration is 1 over square root of 2. And then I do the same transformation inside as I did before, so I get the new integral as being minus du over u to the fourth power. And then I can integrate using the fundamental theorem of calculus, antiderivative of minus 1 over u to the 4, as I've calculated before, is minus u to the, <coughs> sorry, minus 3 over minus 3, evaluated between 1 and 1 over square root of 2. So I'll get 1 over 3, and I get 1 over square root of 2 to the minus 3 minus 1 to the minus 3, which is nothing but the same result as what we got before. So this is 2 square root of 2 minus 1. So this is exactly the same as before. But now you see I did that in a different way. Instead of first finding an antiderivative, rewriting it in terms of x, and then evaluating at x being equal to the endpoints, now I just did the transformation for the limits of integration as well, which is generally a preferred method for evaluating definite integrals using substitution. All right, so let me summarize the two different methods for evaluating definite integrals using substitution. So the first one is the preferred method, and that's actually the second approach that I used in the previous slide. So the idea is to transform the limits of integration from x values to the new variable, so u values, as you perform the substitution. So if you start with an integral of this form, and then you perform a substitution u equals g of x and du equals to g prime of x dx, then you get a new integral in terms of u, and you also transform the limits from x equals to a to u equals g of a, x equals to b to u equals g of b, and you get a new definite integral which you can evaluate directly using the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, so this is the preferred method, but the second method also works if you do it uh, carefully. The idea here is to first find an antiderivative, rewrite everything in terms of x, and then evaluate at the original limits of integration, a and b. That works, but you have to be very careful with notation, as we'll talk about in class, and also you have to make sure that you rewrite everything in terms of x before you evaluate at the limits of integration. So for these reasons, the first method is usually preferred because there's less chances of making mistakes.